Welcome everyone to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast. I'm a networking expert and the author of the upcoming book, No, No Strangers, How to Build Community, One Relationship at a Time. My why is the pursuit of mastery, and the goal of this podcast is to lock arms on a lifelong mission of daily personal growth to become the best version of ourselves. So let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. We are joined by a very special guest. He is the bass player for the Juno Award-winning, multi-platinum, Canadian rock pioneers, I Mother Earth. So welcome to the podcast, Mr. Chuck Daly. Chuck, what's going on, brother? Thanks for having me, Joel. It's it's really cool to be here. Uh, We were talking earlier about your posters behind your back. Very inspiring. I love it. And uh, yeah, stay hard. Stay hard. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta, you gotta have inspiration wherever you can find it. Right. I believe so. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to get started with a couple stories that I think that you'll enjoy. So, so way back in the day, I'm 36 way back in the day when I was 14, I was starting Uh to show, um, that I was serious about, um, a career in the music industry. So my parents drive me from Ottawa to Toronto for Canadian Music Week to see if I can network, if I can learn some things and become a professional. So at Canadian Music Week, I'm 14 and I wait in line for hours at a future shop at Young and Dundas oh my gosh, yep. to get autographs from Edwin, yep. newly solo from I Mother Earth. Um, who else was there? The Mud Men. And last but not least, the salad. So I actually have a picture with you guys and an autograph. And I mean, I would need a gargantuan effort to dig it up and 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 show it. But I do have it. Was was not by choice there. Not by choice was there as well. And was uh, I'm trying to remember her name. She was great. Uh, There was this this young girl that was sort of up and coming at that time, too. Oh my gosh. She was a black girl. It's really, really cute. Beefy Dobson. Beefy Dobson. Yeah. Beefy Dobson. Yeah. 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 A force on stage. Oh, and like, uh yeah. um I it just hit me. Uh Sean Desmond was there. Oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Sean's, Sean's amazing. That's funny. I was gonna ask you if 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 you remembered Canadian Music Week at all, and and you do because you jumped in. And it just yeah. reminded me of a story. Um, my mom and I were there waiting in line and you know, her and I, you know, she doesn't know any of the, the musicians and I'm just pretty laid back. So her and I are just walking around everywhere. It's like security doesn't care about us because we're not freaking out. And out of nowhere, a door opens right beside my mom and Sean Desmond comes out. Yeah. Cool. (laughs) And she, she has no idea who he is. And then the flocks just go crazy. And my mom's like, who is this guy? So we, we were, we were near Sean Desmond for a while. And, He's a pretty and, stunning guy. She must have figured out pretty quick that he was a star. He has that like star quality to him. I guess she probably thought he was yeah. handsome, but had no idea yeah. who he was. So yeah, that was yeah. pretty funny. And then my I love other- his TikToks and social media, like that guy just watch. He, he shares, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but he shares how he produces music. Oh, and you really learn how incredible of a musician the guy is like Mm. and he's just he's very inspired anyhow that's cool (laughs) that's amazing and and the other story is uh about three years later i'm 17 uh, a few of my best friends and I do a mini road trip from Ottawa to Montreal for a Radiohead concert. So there's 60,000 nice. people in Montreal for one band. Uh, we yeah. get there early. We're 17. Quebec doesn't care how old you are. You're allowed to drink. So we're yeah. bar hopping. We go probably five different bars for beer and food. Never ID'd. And out of nowhere, I look out the window yeah. and I say to the guys, isn't that the salads? <laughs> And you guys were walking by. So we come outside, we meet you guys, we talk. That's the first time I actually like legit met you. And I don't remember um, you got, if the whole band was there, you probably weren't there to go see Radiohead because you're not from Montreal. I'm assuming you probably had a show. Yeah, we would have had a show most definitely. Yeah. So at that time, I'm trying to think of. So whenever we went to Quebec or Montreal, it was probably with Stomp Records bands. Like it was probably with uh, Stomp Records is a ra- label from uh, Montreal. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the, owned by the Planet Smashers. Oh, nice. And they had they they were like the guys that found the band Flashlight that became Flashlight Brown that eventually signed to Hollywood Records. And they they just have such a huge catalog of amazing music. But we Would were it be doing, considered like a ska label or indie. Yeah. Oh yeah, full on. It's a full on ska label, Stomp Records in Montreal. And it and it is awesome. They totally have their own sound. Um, you gotta check it out. <laughs> I will check. I'm familiar Canadian with the band. Ska has this like really sort of roots ska feeling to it. Um, and uh, but anyhow, that's likely who we were there with because whenever we went to Montreal or anywhere in Quebec that at that time, it was with Stomp Records bands. And we also toured with. Well, that's not entirely true because we did a tour with Grim Skunk as well. So it may have been with those guys. Okay. Who knows? And. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else we might have played out there with, but that's it was likely a ska show because Montreal loves the ska. They do, they do. <laughs> very, very cultured city. It Super is. music lovers there for sure. And the last part of this story is the same best friends that I was at the uh, Radiohead show in Montreal yeah. for. Um, years later, we road tripped out to Barry for I mother earth's last ever show. We were there at the four hour show. They played everything. They were in the middle of the round. In the middle. I was going to say in the round and like a college. Um, We were there. Then we were at their comeback show uh, in Toronto. Then we were at their show in Ed at edge fest in Toronto. And we now have tickets for the recently announced show in Ottawa. And I know you have the Ottawa and Toronto shows and you added a second date in Toronto. Have you been to that venue yet, Joel? The Bronson center in, in Ottawa. Yeah. It's very intimate. I think I saw our lady peace there at the Junos. Yeah. The Juno ceremonies. Great venue. And it's super fun to play. Like, mm-hmm. I don't, it's just one of those closed rooms that, that feels great to play a gig inside of. So, yeah, really looking forward to those. I think that's why the guys picked both of those venues, um, the Phoenix and Bronson, because they both like they are intimate. And we want to give people I think the idea is to give people that sort of intimate like you're all part of this. Right. And here we are. And let's celebrate you and let's celebrate us and, and this thing that we do together. And here's all of it. Right. And and. Those are two venues that we love playing. Um, and I think the Phoenix, we have two shows now, right? The first one sold out. Yeah. Added so a it second gives us date. the opportunity to do that as well. Um, because there were a couple days around the dates on either side of those. So if that happened, we could expand it. And that looks like we have. And it, it's going to be so fun. And I love uh, when you get to play in a place two or three nights in a row. Mm. It's just because the, by the time you get on there, the second night, which night are, oh, you're coming to Ottawa. I, I'm in Ottawa. So I'm the only Ottawa. Ottawa so that, that's, that's the one night uh, because it's, I love doing two nights because the second night, everything is perfect. By the time you hit a first note, like, you know, it's all going to be bang on exactly the same way it was when you left, mm. which is so fun for me. It's really just about playing and playing as hard, staying hard, right? Playing as hard as, as I possibly can. Right. And, uh, when it sounds good, it gives you the chance to really go for it. So you guys are going to give the people what they want. I hope so. I hope we don't suck. Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> I, I, it's I think a big you, catalog of very long songs and, and it's been quite a while since we played any of those with Brian, like a bunch of years now. And, uh, a lot of those songs are really hard to play. <laughs> and mm. we're all kind of freaking out because we know the work that we've got to do, but we've got a lot of rehearsals scheduled and, um, and it usually starts with, uh, myself and the brothers and we just sort of work through everything. And I, th- I think Jesse, cause we have a keyboard player now. Um, and he's, he's not played any of the Brian songs. So I think he's coming to those rehearsals too, but it's mm. going to be a lot of, a lot of work. And then we eventually, bring in singers and we're going to, I got a rehearsal schedule the other day and it looks awesome because we're going to do a couple days just with Ed and then a couple days just with Brian and then a final two rehearsals with both guys going through the entire show that we're putting on. And wow, wow, it's going to be fun because they're both so wildly different uh, personalities singing wise, but they both fit what the band does. It's going to be pretty cool. So so when you first when you first joined the band, it was the Brian years, and then you've you've gone through the the Edwin years, and now, <laughs> now you got both together. I have, and uh, 
it's funny. I was at that Toronto show that you were talking about too, right? So when they reunited and they did the countdown on the screen, it was super exciting. Was it um, sound? Uh, at the Sound it? Academy. Yeah. 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 They did a couple of days at the Sound Academy and that was off the charts. And that's one of those um, things that that band likes to do too. They rehearse so much. Um, we rehearse so much, but also when you're doing something like that, you get into the club and you do a couple of days of rehearsals in the club. And so that show that we saw at Sound Academy was so honed. So the sound was perfect. The band performed incredibly well. And I could tell you that that's, I was at that reunion show and I turned to my wife, who I went with, and just jokingly, well, maybe not jokingly, because I always like to put it out in the universe as a real thing. I said, well, you know what? I'm a huge fan of Bruce, you know, the original bass player in the band. I think he's one of Canada's best bass players ever and and uh like rock bass players and i'm watching them and i'm saying but he lives in florida you know mel and uh if these guys can't get him up to play a show they better call me and if they don't call me i'm gonna be pissed right and i was just kind of joking and she giggled but I, about five days later i got a call from christian hey chuck it's christian from my mother earth <laughs> was like hey dude what's going on and it turned out they needed a a bass player just to rehearse with um, because Bruce was so busy in Florida. He's a realtor in Florida and he's also part of Blue Man Group there. Yeah. His wife is the Worldwide producer phenomenon, of Blue Man. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They've been going forever. Is producer of, yeah, absolutely. And so he was part of the Toronto Blue Man Group. Um, they don't normally take musicians with them when they move the show, um, but they took him with it, them because his wife is the producer for Blue Man Group. And mm. so it allowed them both to move to Florida and still stay employed. Um, but I could tell you, Blue Man Group is such an amazing gig, like such a wicked cool gig that I've had Bruce on the phone a couple of times. If you ever want to, you know, come up and do the IME gigs, I'll take your Blue Man gigs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd love to try them out. But uh, yeah, so he couldn't, he couldn't make it up for rehearsals. So I started just rehearsing with the band a lot, which was really, really, really fun because I was a huge fan growing up. Um, and then one day Bruce called me, it was about a week before our very, the very first show I played with the band and, and, uh, said, I can't make it up. I can't make it up for the show. I've got this deal that's sort of falling apart. I have a couple tenants that I need to take care of. Like I just cannot leave. And, uh, so can you do the show? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. And, uh, that was hard because <laughs> I, I just kind of knew the songs because I was just rehearsing and, just kind of goofing around. I never really gave it thought that I was going to do that. And the first show was with Slash too. So it was this great big No huge, pressure. Yeah, no pressure, right? A great big huge show. There were probably about 5,000 people there. Was and, that uh, the Empire Rock Fest in Belleville? It was out, outdoors, right? Mm -hmm. It was amazing. And uh, it went really well. I How suppose. nervous were you leading up to that first show? Uh, I was crazy nervous. And that, and it's funny, um, Jag and I have guitar player and I have become very, very close and very, very good friends. And we hug a lot now and, you know, <laughs> been to his wedding. We, we, our family spend a lot of time together, but at the time he was this entity in my life, like this rock hero of mine, right? Like one of my guitar heroes, when I was a teenager, I would go see I mother earth play. I'm about 10 years younger than those guys. And, uh, and I would copy Jag's clothes right? Like I would go out and buy the clothes that he was wearing at the shows. The cool, the cool <laughs> so, rock star. Yeah. And so it was a, a bit intimidating for me, but I can tell you for the very first show, I wore the shoes that I bought when I, after I saw him at uh, the, where was it? The cool house or something like that. Back in the day, I think our lady piece was opening the show, but I remember seeing the shoes and going, I'm going to go get a pair of those cons. And I, and I, so that's what I wore to my first show, but we were standing side stage and he could, tell I was nervous. We were, you know, we had this sort of distance thing. He was still a little bit perturbed that it wasn't Bruce there, I guess, possibly. Um, so it's a little bit harder for them too, because it's this new thing, this new thing they're about to experience. And if, if and, the rhythm section isn't locked in, it's amazing. Oh yeah, man, it's scary. And the, and the, the show, our set time got a little bit delayed. And so we were standing side stage waiting to go on. And, um, uh, Jag was pacing a little bit, his energy sort of gets up there and I was pacing a little bit and we made eye contact and, uh, he looked at me and he goes, you know what? 
And he walked over and he wrapped his arms around me and he hugged me really tight. He says, let's do this, dude. And uh, it was amazing, right? And that was the first time we sort of connected that way. And it made me realize, oh, okay, <laughs> I get where, what this is about and what this show is going to be about. It's really about just connecting with each other and I can do this, right? And, and it went really well. It was really, really fun. I, I, I know the very second show, I was a little bit taken aback. It was a uh, rock fest and a rock show in london ontario and it was with slash and bush x nice. and i think monster truck might have opened the show bush bush x before they dropped the x right yeah 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 you're right oh, no, they right. were so, uh, wait they wanted to be bush but there was a bush already so they're bush x and then once they made a ton of money they just they were able to just drop the x you know they had the money to, so. to pay the original I this, band i had this moment at that show so like i've worked in music for a long time and, and managed a backline company for bare naked ladies and did all the much music awards and did a lot of things where I was in cool situations with people that I love. But at that show in particular, I had this moment where I'm just walking with slash. I'm like, I'm walking with slash, right? Like <laughs> he looks amazing. The inner voice. And, I'm walking yeah, yeah. with slash. And uh, as we're walking and sort of giggling or whatever, I, I look to my right and there's Gavin Rosdale in front of his tour bus. He had just gotten off stage and he's all sweaty and super handsome. I was like, there's Gavin Rosdale what is happening in he's like life, painfully right? handsome that was oh, yeah. it's, my it's sister ridiculous. had posters yeah. of Great of, uh, of Kurt Cobain and Gavin Rosdale those were the two, <laughs> two the two heart dudes yeah. so it's uh but that show when I got on stage I was feeling good because of the first show so this is the second show I think it was maybe even the next day um and uh <laughs> it was raining it was pouring rain and I was amazed that the crowd stayed the entire crowd. I just saw umbrellas go up and people huddle in little circles and the joints getting lit. And I was like, this is really, really cool. People are staying here and they're willing to get wet and watch the band. I'm going to get wet too. And so I dumped my head off the side of the stage because there was just water pouring off the edge of this massive stage, like off the face of it. And so I was able to lean over and get my head in it. And my hair was longer at the time. I thought this is going to look cool. It'll be like Ben from Billy Talent when he dumps water on his head. Right. So <laughs> I stuck my head under. I was like, it yeah. never, it never looks as cool as you think it's going to look. Does well, it? Well, it felt awesome. But then I, I, I stood back up and all the water went all over my body and all over my hands. And it was the center of a song we play. That's about a 15 minute tune of this long jam section. And, and it's, uh, called Earth, Sky, and Sea, and it's got this really, really intense bass part that requires very, very fast movement in your sort of slap hand and your left hand as well, because you're cording and slapping and doing all this ridiculous stuff, this highly technical, hard to play things. And uh, I was soaked and it didn't happen. And uh, well, it didn't happen because as I started doing it, I was like, oh no. And then I looked out and there was someone holding a phone pointing right at me because they're like, I'm going to learn this bass part or I'm going to get them playing this bass part. And that freaked me out. And it all just sort of fell apart. And I just stood there and stopped. Playing. <laughs> and so that was my second show with them. I had a disaster moment, but they were forgiving and, and it's been great ever since. So. You, you got it out of the way early. I know. did. I got a, a horrible mistake and just sort of stopped. And I, I think as a bass player, uh, it's a skill to know to stop rather than play through. Like if yeah. you're if if you're not sure, just it's better to just skip the note. Let them assume the bass just cut out and there's technical yeah, difficulties. Yeah, bass or something. is. I I always equate um equate bass to like the dough of the music. And it, and if you're not playing the right note, the whole cake is gonna fall. Whereas a guitar player is putting the icing on and putting sprinkles and decorating it and. Uh, so you can sort of mess that up and have fun with it and hit a couple bad notes and it's still going to be kind of tasty. Mm. Um, whereas if I screw up the dough, there is no cake. So I'm hungry <laughs> all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> where, where did this, this, where did this love of music come from? And, and do you have a, an earliest musical memory? If you can go way back in time to what kind of caught your attention in the music world? Well, my dad was a professional guitar player. My dad was, um, he went to university. He was the very first guitar player to ever be allowed into the music program at University of Michigan. Um, before that, they didn't view guitar as a serious musical instrument. Isn't that interesting, wow. right? Um, so my dad was the very first. He was, uh, I'm trying to remember who his guitar 
teachers were. They were very famous U.S. They were students of Segovia's anyway. So my dad was a classical guitar player and a jazz musician as well. And and from there, he was drafted during Vietnam. Um, but as a guitar player, being pulled out of music school to go to war, um, they needed a guitar player for the Navy show band. And so mm -hmm. he toured in the Navy show band for years. And there's all sorts of that on YouTube now that's amazing, where it's all black that's and nice. white. And they all have their little white hats sort of side shuffled and doing unison dances. And they, they were public relations. So they were stuck on a ship and sent all over South America to make people love the USA. And, and, uh, and so that's where my love of music came from is from my dad. And, and, and he decided for some reason, maybe he, I remember him telling me that I was different than my brothers. I don't, I don't really even know what that means still. Yeah, well, dad, what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. You've got, there's something different about you. So he took me out and bought me a guitar. Um, and I still have that guitar, but I was little enough that I remember it was just a standard size acoustic guitar made by man, M-A-N-N. -N. I don't know if you remember, they used to make sort of knockoff Gibson guitars back in the eighties. Mm. Um, and I remember looking up at the guitar neck, like, cause it was taller than me. It was just sitting on a stand in the store. And I remember looking up at it and that's the guitar he bought me, um, sent to me to guitar lessons forever which i started to hate right? i was gonna I to ask how how having a uh, guitarist as a dad how you ended up as a bass player well it's i went to so I, I played guitar all my life um i started when i met the guys in the salads in grade seven in public school and was a guitar player then um and i've been playing guitar for a long 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 time at that point um, and so Grant was a great drummer or a drummer in the salads for a little kid. I, there's videos on our DVD and it still blows my mind how good of a drummer he was for a kid in grade seven. Like he was excellent. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so he introduced himself to me and I started playing with him and that's really, um, where it really took off for me. Cause I knew how to play Beatles songs and, and a bunch of, sort of conservatory classical music and I knew some jazz standards and the stuff that you would learn in a sort of scholastic sense from your father who went to jazz school and studied classical guitar um and when I met Grant he was a huge Kiss fan and wore cut off shirts and had long hair and his room was plastered with Kiss posters and he had a double he kid. was the cool kid oh he was so cool and he showed and then it got to a point where him and it was just me and him. And then Dave showed up. Dave had bought a guitar, a guitar player in the, in the salad. Ziembe? Ziemba. Ziemba. And, uh, Ziemba. That was my best and, guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we used to just jam all the time. And that's truly where my love came from it. Because then I started to realize what it was to rock and what it, that felt like and what, it, and what that was sort of friendship. So it was really all based on friendships, I guess. It started with my dad but became a friendship based thing. And we all became kind of shredders because it was, um, I think it was just the nature of our relationships. We were just always challenging each other. And so I was it, I'm, was it with Dave showing up as a guitarist that you transitioned to bass? Uh, well, we, it was the three of us for the longest time as little kids in, in public school. And we were playing little shows and stuff, but um truth be told dave was not invited to play our first show because he still <gasps> didn't know how to play guitar and that he has admitted to us that that's what drove him to say screw these guys and he got so damn good like so fast <laughs> um and he's so over the top amazing there if you just google or look on youtube for dave ziemba z-i-e-m-b-a you'll find all sorts of crazy videos of him just playing and it's off the charts amazing when he went to mi in hollywood he was the top of the school there and the other guys he's playing with the drummers ended up playing with chick korea the bass player was playing with weasel zappa uh, um but dave will, dave came home <laughs> and we kept the band going but uh i became a bass player not only because dave got so good um but because the bass player that we hired um, decided he didn't want to do it anymore. He wanted to become a, a school teacher. 
he decided to go to school and I don't want to tour. I don't want to, um, I think it was at a system of a down and incubus show we went to at the opera house. He's like, I don't want to do this. He's watching the show. I don't want to do this, <laughs> which was really hard. But, uh, at the time we had just finished our very first record and it was exciting. We were doing shows and we were doing things like Canadian music week. And, and, uh, and so I said, you know what, I'll just play bass. I thought it would be easy and it was not easy. That's when I learned my dough theory that I couldn't screw up. Like if I played bad notes, it was terrible. Right. So it came from a combination of Dave being so damn good. Um, he was also spoiled rotten by his parents. So he had, his gear just kept getting he better. He just sounded better. And it sounded so much better. His tones, and he's like this tone monster as well. He just really understands gear um, and always had way too much of it, but it just crushed me. It just kept crushing me. And I'm more of a meat and potatoes kind of guy. I like, like an amp and a cable and plug me in. Um, it just made sense. But over the years, I've learned to play bass. And when I started playing with I Mother Earth is what, you know, it's funny. I played in cover bands for years playing bass and I do all sorts of corporate gigs playing bass and play with all sorts. I sometimes call myself bass player to fancy guitar players um, because those are the gigs I seem to get. Um, but uh, over the years, it's, I don't remember where I'm going here because I, I sort of got sidetracked with the fancy guitar players. What was uh I saying, Joel? Well, you're ta you're 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 sharing the story of how you ended up on the bass. Oh, and, uh, well, yeah. So I learned how to play bass when I joined I Mother Earth is what I wanted to say. That's when I really learned. OK, that's where that's it got when I really learned how to play bass. I, it's funny because I made all of those salads records as a bass player, um, produced all those and and did tours endlessly. But I learned that I could play bass best with a pick at that point. And like I, I was doing my fingers and stuff just for the tone of it, but because I was a guitar player for so many years and I went to Humber college for guitar as well. I went to jazz school for guitar, mm. um, that it would just like, I was sick of having notes ghost and be slightly at a time. It was driving me crazy because my fingers and still trying to learn. So I just reverted back to a pick, mm. um, and was like, oh, it's so tight and fast. I can do this now. Who cares if I'm going to get teased about playing bass with a pick? It sounds good. Um, and so when I joined I Mother Earth, Bruce only plays with his fingers and his fingers are like lead. I don't right? get He's I don't get how bass players can do that. I mean, I, I'm a guitarist and when I play bass, it's like the speed, like I can't get the speed that I can get with a pick and speed, you watch and the, the good bass Bruce. players and it's He's like, I don't know how they do it. Ridiculously fast, right? Like the things that he does with two fingers going, but that, that, that. I have to go back and forth. Bop, 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 bop. I figured out how to do it because it's the only way I can get up the speed. Yeah. You can do it all down strokes where I have to go down, up, down, up, down, up, and then I can get to the speed. But <laughs> so insane. So it really forced me to learn how to play. Like it forced me to learn how I really, 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 really wanted that gig. Um, and so I, I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced and never ever stopped. Um, I would sleep. And, and I learned how to play bass. That's so funny. You learn how to play bass by joining like one of the most iconic Canadian rock bands of all time. It was well, like, like it. some of the That's motivation bass lines in Canadian rock of all time. And it's like, I had no, if I wanted to do this, I had to get good. Right. Like, and the funny thing with Jag is he just believed in me. And when I first met with him, when we were going to discuss whether I was going to play some bass with them. Um, and just do rehearsals, really. I just went to his house and we sat across from each other on couches and just played guitar together for like half an hour. And then he's like, ah, that's cool. And we just sort of noodled around. We weren't playing I'm Other Earth songs. Um, and then we sat in the kitchen and drank coffee for a couple hours. But it was, he, uh, all he said to me was, you can't play it now, but I can tell by your personality that you're going to learn how to do all of this. You're going to figure it out. So I'm good. Let's go have a coffee right like it's like what really okay all right so what uh, what was it like having bruce there where you're able to shadow him to learn the songs and not just uh, like here well, are I, here are the four albums get to it well i have um 
Jag also gave me bass and drum isolated tracks of all the records, which is oh, super cool. That would be cool. Not not just to learn the bass, but just to hear that. That would be awesome. Oh, yeah. I can hear where Jag plays bass, right? Like where you can hear you can hear Bruce's fingers. I get really used to hearing what his hands sound like. And I'm very used to hearing what Jag sound like now as well. So when it's when I hear that bass track isolated, I can hear it going from Bruce's hands to Jag's hands for certain parts which I've always done recording as well. Like um, I'll play the guitar on Salad's tunes if it's doubling the bass part, hmm. um, just because it's going to be so tight. And so he's, it sounds like he's done that on records as well. Like when they're doing unison riff stuff, I might be mistaken, but that's what it sounds like to me. Well, I was just, so I've gone back and I've listened to all four uh, yeah. All four albums from My Mother Earth with a good pair okay. of headphones. Yeah, uh, I went you. back that's and a, listened to the dedication. salads as well. Yeah. Uh, I got to be prepared. I, I was already familiar with all the music, but I wanted to, as a fan, really get in that zone before coming into this yeah. cool. uh, this podcast episode. And when you talk about you know being able to hear Jag and maybe there was some bass and and you know different tones and all that. Uh, summertime in the void. There's, you know, there's an awesome, you know, kind of bass riff that goes through the whole song and 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 is kind of guiding that song. Um, and, but there are parts where I'm not sure if it's guitar or bass. It, it, yeah, it's the like there's this mixed, one sonic right? tunnel going on. So I, I thought I would throw that out. That's I love to hear you say that, actually, Joel, because uh, when I first it's reminding me when I first started learning these songs, that was my I don't know if it was a complaint. It was my comment about how hard it was to learn them to jag was I, I can't hear the bass I, like I, I can't tell when it's bass I can't tell when it's guitar um so I was learning guitar parts on bass thinking it was the bass part and stuff and he was like what are you talking about the bass is as clear as day right and so then well, I was he knows taking, the difference right yeah he, but he, then can, he can visualize without even hearing he knows well, of course and you know. then I was taking those records and I remember playing it in the van with Dave Z with Dave Zimba from the salads and going can you hear the bass line right Mm. And uh, Dave, of course, so in tune goes, yeah, I, was like, what? <laughs> I can't hear. It. So it's so nice to hear you say that because I hear that, too. It's so interweaved and mixed in a way that it sometimes it's like, is that guitar or bass? And also Jag is such an incredible sort of rhythmic guitar player and he plays slap guitar. Right. So sometimes it comes across as as it sounds like it might be a bass. Um, I'm trying to think of that one song that was in Fast and Furious on Quicksilver Meat Dream. Oh my gosh, there's a tune on there that's that starts with a, it sounds like slap bass, but it's actually mm. a gu guitar. And I remember for that rehearsal, I came in playing the guitar part and he's like, no man, you just go boom, three, four, boom, two, three, four, boom. Wow. And I go boom, boom, back, 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 back. And I'm yeah. like, oh, shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there, are, there are a few bands where when you're listening, you're not sure if it's guitar or bass. Like there's, there's I'm Mother Earth. There's um, Muse sometimes. Yeah. They have some cool riffs where you're not sure. And there's just three of them. So it's like, they have to, you know, and like Rush where there's only three. So between them, they sound like 12 people, but well, they're it, each it doing meshes. different things. And it's also learning. Um, the I White Stripes like, as well. Sometimes you can't yes. tell bass or guitar. <laughs> Absolutely. Cause he's playing both and he'll play a baritone as well. And so the, um, wow, yeah, you, you've opened up a huge can of worms and are making me think real hard about all of this, but I've learned so much about tone and what you're talking about is, is the tone of a good rock bass. And it's um, like amateur guitar players or people that are starting out recording or playing heavy rock stuff, they tend to use too much distortion. They crank the distortion all the way up because they're like, it sounds so badass, but they don't realize that it just sounds like. <sighs> right. But to them, they know what's going on. So they feel it in their fingers. What are you talking about? It's just heavy. But really, the best distortion is when you bring it way down, <laughs> it's still going to sound heavy. And so the thing with bass guitar that I've learned that I'm told all the time now is there's always going to be enough bass through the front of house. You don't need to do that on stage. Like I don't need to, the bass doesn't have to sound like reggae bass in a rock band. It, mm. You shouldn't crank up. It's, it's more about the mids, the middle tones, not the bottom tones. And so I'm always fiddling with my mids. All the sound on bass comes from mids. 
And so it's all that mid-range frequency. So that's what you're hearing on those records is all those people just really understand the tone of a good bass, rock bass guitar tone, which generally sounds like a guitar. It's just a couple of guitars sort of weaving around each other, right? Hmm. And the bass kind of supports the riff or takes it somewhere else, right? And I just made a record over COVID with a brand new band that um, I'm not going to mention the name of it, but they Top were a secret. power. Yeah, they're a power duo. Everybody will hear about it soon enough. We just shot a video. And it's not them. the retired white stripes. We can confirm that. No, that would be cool, though. I'd love to play with Jack White. Oh, my gosh. But uh, genius. Yeah. 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 Good bass player to fancy guitar players. Um, but uh, I have this record coming out that's uh, it was mixed by Howard Benson, who's done like Hoobastank and the Zebra Head. Three and Days Grace. POD and Three Days Grace. Yeah, he has a production company with Neil um, from Three Days Grace. And Neil actually produced the whole record that I worked on. Wow. Um, and that one it was hilarious. We got the mixes back from Howard. Um, and it's just a bass, a guitar, and a drummer, right? That's that's the band. And then there's a, a, there's a lot of singing in there, of course. But the... I got it back. I listened through. I was like, this sounds amazing, but there's no bass guitar. It's all guitar. And I called the guitar player, you know, the other guy in the band and was like, what do you think? He's like, I love this, but there's no guitar. It's all bass. I was like, what are you talking about? It's, it's all guitar. I can't hear any bass. No, you're wrong. And so we said, so we put it on and listened on the phone for a while and we started giggling. Cause we were like, you know what it is. They're both there and he's doing this, what he's weaving them. Right. Mm. And so it, it's that same thing, but on another level where I couldn't even hear myself any, I couldn't even hear myself. I didn't realize that, oh crap, Howard just really understands tones yeah. better than I ever will. Right. So. And mi mixing engineers love when it's, when there's simplicity in the music, like when, yes. you know, when Green Day, where there's the drums, the guitar and the bass, then they can make it sound massive because they just take each of those three and they're able to create this sonic landscape when there's too much stuff going on, everything's fighting for a spot. So they Candy, love just yeah. like one guitar and they can do something <laughs> huge with it. You know, it's pretty remarkable. It, it, people are going to hear about this record when it comes out as the band signed to a, a great deal in the U S and we shot videos and you'll all hear it soon enough. Um, I think they might still be promoting the band as sort of a two piece, but it's got my bass all over it now. Um, and I think they're able to still do that because of that tone thing we're talking about where it sort of weaves around and people aren't going to even know the difference. Right. Mm. So whatever, we'll see what happens. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. Let's, um, are you good if we dive into the salads for just a few minutes? Cause I was a big fan of the salads, you know, yeah, yeah, so I get course. to sit down here with, you know, a member of the salads and you did a lot of the business stuff and we'll dive into that. I mean, the salads are important in your journey because they were kind of the gateway to becoming a professional in the entertainment industry. I mean, the success you had with, you know, the hit singles like get loose and, uh, what is it? The Kung, the, the Roth, Roth Kung, Kung Fu. Fu. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so I, I remember just like hearing those hits on the radio, seeing the music videos, all that stuff. Um, how important were the salads to your journey of, of getting where you are today with, I mean, bass player for our I mother earth. There's this other band that, that is yet to be announced the radio shows, the gigs with the bare naked ladies you've played with not by choice and our lady peace. And maybe I'm, hopefully I'm not making up some I, of this I played, stuff. No, yeah. no, that's cool. I played in Billy talent for a while too. I don't know if you know that. That's um, you've, you've literally played in arguably three or four of like the biggest rock bands ever in Canada, which is pretty exciting. <laughs> I guess so. I, I, well, the, it's funny to say the salads were the, the gateway to my success as in, in the rock music world in Canada, because that's basically just saying I'm responsible for my own success uh, because I ran that band. I was the record label. I, I, I did all I did almost all of the business for that band. Dave Z would join me when we would go meet with um graphic designers or the band would come along when um when we all shot a video but prepping it all would be me with the video company and me with whoever we're trying to hire whatever lawyer if I'm going to New York and meeting it's me right and so it was just my success in rock and roll comes from my own personal drive mm -hmm. to want to do it um and 
in every band that's has success has a guy like me in it yeah <laughs> it's if you don't have a guy like me in the band you're not going to go anywhere like someone that's just going to relentlessly push and push and push and push and push and push and never stop and refuse to stop and just push towards your goals right and it's um it translate i'm a realtor now in prince edward county and eastern on all of eastern ontario from like perth to peterborough almost and it's uh because of my rock and roll traveling, I can do large pieces of geography. I just understand this province, but it's the, exactly the same thing. I was able to jump in during the pandemic. I pivoted into real estate because touring stopped um, and just apply maybe 2% of what I put into the salads, like just a small bit of what I would do with that band. And I just took off flying. Um, and I'm realizing that real estate is an easy thing for me to succeed at um, because I've already done it and I did it with music and music's way harder. Mm. Music's so much harder. Like, and then it, in, a, in addition to music being harder, you never know if you're actually going to get paid either. Whereas real estate, it goes into a trust account and you know, you're getting paid. So like all of my anxiety of business has gone away, <laughs> but it's, mm -hmm. Um, and now in the music business, yes, I've, I've done so much and I worked so hard running record labels and pushing and getting video grants and album grants and getting really good at that. And, and uh, I used to just make goals that I thought were unattainable and, and say, I have to finish this goal by the end of the week. Um, or basically, Chuck, you're a piece of shit. I, I don't know how do you, else to explain. You're one of those just, tough. I just was hard guys. on myself, right? Yeah. Like, if you don't do this, what oh, do you want this or not? Right? Like, and my goal at the time was to hire Rick Rubin, right? I really wanted Rick Rubin. Only the know? greatest producer of all time. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't care. Why not? The guy's alive, right? And <laughs> um, well, his, his up... heart rate is probably very close to not being sure if he's alive because he's so <laughs> zen, you know? But... He is zen. Um, but that, but it was things like that where I would try to figure out how to get in touch with people and, and, push myself forward. Um, and it all translates into everything I'm doing now. So my success with the salads was completely self driven, but it was also being very aware that what I had was amazing. Like, I don't think I could convince anybody that it was great if it wasn't great. Um, and I don't think emotionally I could ever do that or ethically like I have to truly believe it's amazing right it's like a lot of houses I don't let people buy them because I'm like no 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 no. let's go over here yeah. uh it's the same sort of thing yeah it's don't just, make eye contact with that one we're gonna go over to this yeah one. yeah and it's because I'll see people get excited but it's I'm not trying to control them I'm just trying to help them make a better decision right hmm. um it is the same. It's the same thing I did with music. I just pushed forward and took my friends along with me. Um, Grant, our drummer, is now playing with his wife, Danny Strong, and Danny Strong has that drive that I had back then. And so they're pushing forward and doing this amazing thing. When Darren Pfeiffer joined the Salads, that was such a crazy gift for me because mm -hmm. there's another guy that has that same drive that I had, um, and we started doing it together um, i have uh, i have a surprise for you i don't know if oh, you're you ready do. for this so i reached out to a few people okay to hear their thoughts on mr chuck daly so uh -oh. i have a comment for you from mr darren pfeiffer yeah uh -oh. so, so when i asked them i said what is it that you love about chuck daly as a musician and as as a person and he says uh he says you know what chuck is genuine uh, what you see is what you get. His heart is made of gold. He's an incredible musician. He's, he's a fun hang and he's just a solid human. I'm happy to call him a friend. So that's Darren Pfeiffer, who was a member of Goldfinger, some 41 oh, that's so and kind. played and, with and you so in the tame. I, I thought he was going to say something offensive in there. Or, or well, I did have to censor, I did I have to censor a little bit. Right? Yeah. 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 You know him. I had to censor <laughs> slightly, but, uh, oh, yeah, the, the drums have stopped on stage while I've been playing with him and and playing forward through this like heavy tune and like where are the drums and i'll turn around and he's got his pants off and he's making love to my bass cabinet because he's so happy with the bass tone so yeah that that's a very nice conservative 
professional compliment. So thank you. <laughs> I, I PG 13. I made that the Dawson Creek of comments so that everyone. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> Dawson know? Creek. The salads had a lot of songs on Dawson's Creek. That man, Dawson's Creek was where it was at when I was growing up. So yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> That's too funny. Now I have, uh, I have another person speaking of the salads. Uh -huh. uh, I reached out to someone and, and this is a funny mutual friend here. So when I was 18, I went to OE art uh, in, okay. in London, Ontario for audio engineering. Amazing. And one Great of the guest school. speakers was Dan Broadbeck. Oh yeah. Dan, well, Dan is in... one of those guys that I gave myself a week to call where I was so impressed by him and so blown away at what he could do with the Gandarvas and so many other bands. He had, um, at the time, a band, Bomb 32, who became a band called Headstrong, um, got signed to RCA. Um, and we were playing with them all the time with the Salads. They're sort of a rap, rock, heavy band. Um, really good band. Uh, RCA was doing their demos with Broadback, and eventually Clive Davis just was said, this is so good. Just wow, do the record with Broadbeck, right? Just do the mm. record with Dan. Um, and when we got the Headstrong record, it was like, this is unbelievably amazing. Um, because we knew the band. We knew what they already sounded like. They were good, but Dan brought them like through the roof. And, and so my thought was, I'm going to call this Dan guy and ask him if he'll work with us right if he can do that with that band i wonder what he can do with us right and uh, and he did multiple albums or all of them he, he was a big done, part of the he's, had, he's he? been on a piece of every single one of them so even mm -hmm. the the our record music every day even dave and i recorded all of that ourselves it was just the two of us um but we sent it well actually we had siegfried meyer who taught at oyart recorded the drums well. on that record yeah. he didn't he recorded the drums on, on that record um, and edited the drums. Dave and I did all the guitars and vocals at home, but then we sent it to Broadbeck to mix. So we paid him to mix that album. Um, we were attempting to mix it on our own, but we needed, we realized that Dan is a member of the salads. And if Dan isn't part of the record, it doesn't sound like the salads anymore. So. Hmm. Well, I have, I have a nice comment. I didn't have to, I didn't have to uh, PG 13 this at all. Uh, yeah, so Dan brilliant. says, Chuck is first and foremost, a great person. I don't care how talented someone is if they're not a nice person. So I'd rather be around great people. Chuck is a great person. Oh, and he's a great musician. His love of music is what, uh, what makes him a great musician. It's always great fun working with those guys because we all just love making music, which shows on all those records, I think. So that's from Dan. Yeah. Dan has this, uh, I've working with Neil was really amazing actually over the pandemic neil from three days grace him and i were very in tune and heard a lot of the same things neil has a real way to use space in music he knows when to be quiet he understands the silence in music and how powerful that is and i think when you hear any three days grace there's so many quiet stops um but um broadbeck and i connected in a way um, that I found really remarkable. I used to get up in the morning really early. So we would live in London at, uh, they were called the executive suites in London. We Sounds rented. fancy. It was not executive and it was not fancy, but it was affordable. And we could all stay in the room because it was like an apartment basically. Um, but I would, uh, it was an East, beautiful East London as well, <laughs> which is a horrible part of town. But uh, I would wake up, crack it on and get to the studio i'd ride my bike or walk over or whatever and uh get in there just so that i could work with dan alone um because i knew the rest of the guys weren't going to be there for a couple hours and i wanted the opportunity to get things out of my head onto the record without anybody critiquing it right like i wanted to just get it out of my head and onto the record and if i can get there and it's just dan what I learned about Dan was we heard the same thing. Mm. Um, so I knew that when I did that, I could go, Dan, I've got this idea for this part of the song. And he would say, what do you mean? This idea? Does it, you were, are you going to sing this? And he would sing it at me. And I go, that's exactly. And then I want to do this with it. And he goes, I know you do. Right. Like, and so we just had this, we were Get out of my this, head. 
yeah, we were hearing the same things, which was pretty awesome to me. And then he also had the ability, my favorite thing I ever did is on our big picture record. It's a song called Thick and Thin. It's at the last, like into the very last chorus of the song. I think we're coming out of a bridge. But it, there was a thing, I, I can't remember where it was on a record, but it, to me, it sounds like someone's taken a lasso and thrown it over the song, pulled it tight and yanked it back at you. I'd see everything really visually music. Um, and I and I tried to explain this thing to Dan. I want it to sound like it's going away and then coming back in a wave, go and almost sound like it's in reverse and then explode into the chorus. And he did it exactly right. It's this like layered harmony thing that drops down and then whips back and it has that lasso effect. So I don't know. That's he had to strange, work the, the the panning knob, something fierce. To it's make neat. It There's like reverse piano in there. He did all, all these layers of stuff, but it was exactly bang on. So yeah, I adore Dan and his ears are out of control because like that Gandarva's record that he did, I think he did it when he was a teenager, right? So it's like one of these people that are just genetically prone to being able to hear things that way. Like I don't really get it. Some people just develop their talents early. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the talent that Dan does not have is growing facial hair. Like you've got a gorgeous beard, Joel, and and Dan, no matter how hard he pushes, nothing comes out. He also, (laughs) I also remember when he came in. uh, So back when I was about 18, when he came in, he, he actually said his age at that time and he was way older than he looked like he, I, I think he had oh, started forever young. Yeah. 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 So I think that no beard actually helps him with, with how young he looks <laughs> and, and he was like in really good shape and, and yeah, he had yeah, like, well, he yeah, had something going guy. on. He's, he's super handsome too. Right. Like him and Gavin Rosdale, but, but it's uh yeah, he still looks great. I think he just turned 54. I think wow. it was his birthday last week. And I think he turned 54. I might be missed. I know he's in his fifties, but yeah, he looks like he's still 30 years old. Yeah. Mm. He got those, uh, those good genes or he's got the fountain of youth that he's not sharing with anyone else except it's, Gavin Rosdale. Yeah. It's rock and roll. I don't know. Forever young, really, I guess. Rock and roll. It, right. It does something. It really does. You know, my older brother is, uh, and his wife, his wife, uh, does the Iron Man marathons and does very very well and he climbs mountains and is this and rides his bike to work even though he's a partner in a law firm he just takes his bike everywhere but he's uh he always swears that the only fountain of youth that we have is physical health right is like staying healthy exercising and eating well right um where i'm like no man rock and roll (laughs) <laughs> like we need we need scientific proof also... we need testing for for rock and roll for, <sighs> look you know? at dan broadback look at gavin rosdale we, we look, need to stick I'm, some I'm needles into dan I think broadback i'm still doing pretty good i, I but it, it's like the i just find that the majority of my friends that stick with it have this real youthful playful nature to them um, where they never, ever stopped being children. They, they still continue to see the importance of playing, um, that the best part of being alive is playing. I, I taught guitar for over 20 years, and I never once told the kid to practice. I'd always tell him to go home and play, right? And, it, and it's, that's, that's key. And, and I think that's one of the, the s- tricks to staying young is just, holding on to that never letting it go right like it's my opinion anyway. i've i've heard that most people know in their heart of hearts why they're on this planet what they're here to do by the time they're like 17 and the thing is most people don't follow that because it's usually something creative where you know society says that's not something an adult's gonna do and uh so i think i think I think you're onto something that uh, if you can, if you can cultivate that childlike wonder and, and what is it you loved as, as a kid, I love to play music. I love to play video games. And then there are people that do music and make money. And there are people that do video games that make money now. Well, yeah, when, so- you're, when you're a kid, you use your imagination and you play like all you do is play and use your imagination. So keep it up. Right. So many people mm-hmm. get that pushed away or they feel 
they get shamed. They get ashamed out of them, you know, grow up. It's like, no, <laughs> like, I think I, I, the most beautiful concert I ever saw was a maybe two years ago, like right before the pandemic. Um, and I tried to convince every musician friend I knew at the time um, that I thought might like to go to this, to go to the show and nobody bought tickets. I ended up buying tickets for my whole family um, and took them. And it was Jacob Collier, who's now won 12 Grammys and is one of the most world famous top musicians. Herbie Hancock is getting tutored by him now. And he's just wow. a, um, but it was at the opera house. It was only $20. He, he, I think he just did two or three shows at the Danforth music hall and the tickets were like 150 bucks or something. But did I, you get I, the steal of the century? I think those I tickets did. It was were... 20 bucks at the opera house and Daniel Caesar came out and performed with them too. Who's Daniel Caesar is massively famous. Um, is Daniel Caesar one of the singers on peaches from Justin Bieber? I think so. I think it's him and one other guy and just yeah, Bieber. yeah, because Daniel's amazing. That's and probably how most people listening to this podcast would would <laughs> know who that is. Is he's on but, uh, Peaches from Justin Bieber, guys. Well, it's there a great you show, go. Great yeah, show. yeah, the Peaches from Georgia and the yeah. weed from California. But the uh, those lyrics are amazing. Come on, yeah. and the um, but the the point of that in his entire show, and so he's done. He's this remarkable musician. If you have if your listeners haven't heard Jacob Collier yet. It's a deep rabbit hole of just insane, amazing music. Um, he's gotten recognized by every crazy, amazing musician in the world, basically. Because I, in my opinion, he's maybe the best musician that's ever lived, been on wow. the planet. But he, yeah, he came out and was playing the most amazing percussion thing I've ever heard. And I play with Danielle and in my mother earth and he's off the charts amazing but this kid jacob collier came out he's very kind of nerdy looking and came out and just started ripping on this massive percussion set playing all this polyrhythmic stuff and then with the biggest amount of joy leaped over a bunch of amplifiers like fully jumped in the air landed at a grand piano and just started tearing it up on the grand piano and then grabbed the bass and was so he plays everything he plays everything but the, my point about him is that what we were watching him do was play mm. right and and he was just up there playing and being a child um and showing and his all of his records that he's put out are called the jess it's spelled d-j-e-s-s-e -S -S -E, and he's done the jesse volume one the jesse volume two and the jesse volume three they're all epic and amazing um and what he taught us at that concert was exactly what i've been telling you that and i was like oh my god someone else feels this way is that he was telling everybody to remain don't lose sight of your inner child and the jesse is a character he created that is his inner child and so he's made volume one volume two volume three all dedicated to his inner child and so then he, when he gets on stage one of the things he does is he gets the audience to sing and he com and he directs them and gets different sections to do rhythms and then he gets everybody doing harmonies and he recognizes most of his audience are musicians so the thing sounds amazing um but all he's doing is playing and he just pushed it and pushed it and pushed it don't stop playing play 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 right and uh, mm. and uh if that's all it takes to be that amazing <laughs> then play Right. Don't well, I, I, I think, you know, I think you guys and I mother earth that play is there because you have in, in even the recorded songs, you guys have more jams and, and crazy guitar riffs and breakdowns and interludes than most people have in their, their songs. So I think there's that creativity and play within the songs. And then live, you're just talking about like, Oh, I think that's a 15 minute song. And oh, you, yeah, know, you, you extend everything even more. So, you know, how integral are those epic jams to kind of the the central heart of I Mother Earth and and what they're known for? Oh, uh, that's a huge part of what the band is, right? It's this big organic jam, and it's yeah. all. And so really, it comes. I think uh, you had sent me a message that that you thought the Jag sounds like the Canadian Tom Morello. Right. And that's his skill set and the fact that he probably uses a whammy a lot. So he hits all those. Well, just said it's notes. it's so keep in mind, I had just listened to four albums straight 
And what I got out of it was just how unique his guitar playing is. So the yeah. actual playing, um, the creativity, uh, how unique the sounds are. So that's some of the Tom Morello is, is that stuff, just yeah. how unique, how creative, how different, how he's playing with the sounds. It's not just the guitarist. It's like a sonic scientist where the sounds are sonic important scientist. too, you know? I love that. That's actually a great dj name dj the sonic scientist you want right? to start a, a dj duo will be the sonic scientist i have no dj talent so i'm hoping that's a really do. good name i think we just gave it away on the podcast though quickly well, it's that tra- it'll be trademarked when this goes live so there you go <laughs> uh yeah well i was gonna say that uh the that, jag all is that, all that jamming tom morello yeah all that jamming stuff and you're hearing tom morello because it's unique and and cool and interesting to listen to and uniquely him um but that band they're all in their 50s i guess i think danielle just turned 60 even i'm in my mid 40s uh but they come from the school of van halen so you're mm. hearing a lot of eddie inspired tones Okay. Jag really has that brown sound that Eddie always talked about. I, I don't know what it's called when people hear music in colors, but it, it, that's that's what we're doing, and and it's creating a brown sound. Um, and uh, his, I don't ever like to sit, talk for other people, but I I can tell from my experience playing with them that their stuff comes from Van Halen, Rush is a huge influence on what they do, which are these long epic progressive songs. King Crimson is another one that's a long progressive jam sort of things, but their main love is Santana. They all love Santana. I right? saw him and, in Montreal. Yeah, yeah, and I never I never really paid that much attention to Santana before playing with those guys. And that's what it is. It's just this in, these inspired jams. Um, and so a lot of what we do is based on what santana does so do you think i I wanted to ask about the cowbell there's there's a lot of cowbell there's a lot of percussion music right all of so i'm wondering is that actually the santana i was wondering where all this percussion and and cowbell comes from is that actually the santana influence and the other thing i was going to ask is with so much cowbell yeah do you think will ferrell is deeply proud of of i mother earth for taking his favorite (laughs) instrument Uh, to the world stages. I would love Will to join the band for a show. That'd be so killer. <laughs> I yeah. don't know how Danielle would feel about it. His but, drum uh, offs with his twin in the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Oh, Chad that is, Smith. Those are amazing. Giving right? him some experience on the drums. So maybe he could actually pull off a show as your drummer. Who knows? <laughs> it's pretty cool. So, uh, well, the cowbell, it's, it's, and all that percussion, it all, and Santana, it all comes from Latin music, right? Um, and the cowbell is one of those instruments that can carry over top of everything and carry that rhythm, you know, and when you get into Latin music, I'm not an expert, but I know a lot of it is done with clapping, right? Clapping that part of your hand so it's nice and really loud. Um, and you get those. It is like a I Mother kind of rhythm. Um, and th- you would hit that on the cowbell so that you can really, really hear it, right? And uh, that, that's how I'm hearing it anyways, is it's a carrier of your rhythm and it, and it can really help. And um, I had a really good friend who was the musicology teacher at the University of Ghana that I grew up with that was a drummer friend of mine. Um, and it, it was the same thing when he played in the uh, Ghana Drum Ensemble in Toronto. He was the only white guy in this band um but it was he was teaching us and we were the salads were actually having the Ghana drum ensemble play shows with us all over the place it was amazing um but it's carried the same way it's either like on a djembe playing one constant rhythm like that that everybody else sort of revolves around um and a cowbell can carry that i guess so it's it's Mm -hmm. The percussion is a huge part of it. And where I stand on stage and I Mother Earth, I'm directly in front of the percussion set. Um, and it is so fun, Joel. Oh my gosh. Because Danielle is amazing. And the amount of cool rhythmic stuff happening directly behind me that's just keeping me in time 
and it's all like sixteenths, and it's all really quick. So you're always hearing ticka 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 ticka, which makes it really really easy to play in time. When something's going duck, 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 there's a lot harder. of space in between. Right? Yeah, but... it's a lot easier when things are going ticka 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 ticka. So it can really keep the speed up, and and wow, is it ever inspiring? Yeah. Do you, do you find yourself parallels. turning turning around and kind of jamming with him quite frequently in the show? All the time, just yeah. trying to get his eye and trying to catch his eye. And he, he's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful man too. And he's just, and uh, the love that he can give you mid song is just, yeah, <laughs> it helps. It helps. So, mm. And so it's one of the things where as we talk right now, Joel, and our numbers are jumping up I'm, I'm not sure when you're airing this um but we're in the middle of the covid virus taking a new turn and it looks like it's likely shutting down shows and we're going to take caution because we don't know how dangerous it is yet hopefully this wave ends quick enough but i can tell you that driving around yesterday listening to the news knowing this is impending i thought about danielle and i thought about percussion and i thought about this little taste that I've had in this break where we got to do live shows again. And talking to you about it right now, I just feel like breaking down and crying because it's everything. It's everything. It's yeah. that rhythm and music and just doing that thing that we do and we love. And now to have it stop again, I need yeah, they, to have that they percussion just, behind me. They it's just like, announced that any sporting or entertainment events over a thousand people is cut back down to 50 percent. so that's starting to and that's in ontario right yeah right so hopefully you know hopefully it's just you know maybe a month and then it opens up again and these shows that's what i'm hoping march, so that's what i'm hoping or at least the ottawa shows in march i think yeah looking at um the numbers and other places it seems these waves happen for a month but we'll yeah. see <laughs> we'll see because I, I would hate to miss the opportunity to keep playing with these guys because, oh, my gosh, to come back and do it is a real reminder. Um, it, it became it, it got weird. It's like we you almost forget a little bit. Um, I know how important it is and how you you were talking about how you, you decide what you're going to do when you're 17. Whenever I'm on stage playing, I know that it's absolutely the thing I need to be doing right at that moment. There's no question. It's like, yes, this is exactly it. Like, this is why I'm here. This is why I'm alive. This is the best thing I could possibly be doing with my time right now. Um, it's about to go away again. Right. And I, uh, it's very, very difficult. So when you, you know. said, when you said you got your tickets to Jacob Collier, um, oh, yeah. You know, before the pandemic, I was going to ask what was life like before the pandemic. You know, I can't, <laughs> I can't remember what what that was like back then. So it's cool, right? There was a trend going on the other day. Joel, of, um, post a photo of yourself pre pandemic, right? Like, and it, and yeah. it's, and I found it. I loved that that trend going around because it really made me think hard about the looks on people's faces and their state of minds and prior to really your psyche and the life you're used to being turned upside down, right? Like everybody's changed. And when you yeah. see all those pictures, it's like, whoa, right? Like we were so relaxed. We really were. We felt tense, but we were so relaxed. <laughs> so, and uh, nobody is anymore. Like we're very wound up, right? Like. Yeah. Yeah, the pandem pandemic's been tough for me. I'm, I'm very social. I'm normally running a yes. bunch of events. So all the I events, are, yeah. I haven't done an event in two years. I, um, oh I, I would normally have. Yeah, you're about sharing knowledge with large groups of people. Exactly. Right? So yeah. three days yeah. a week or more, I would have like 20 to 30 people in my house, just teaching business Ooh, and networking. So and wonderful. You know, and my every year I have this like, this famous birthday house party where I have like a hundred yes. people in my house. Yes. Thank you for the invite. There you go. And there's, yeah. and, and then there's just nothing for two years. So it's been very, you know, it's been very hard. And I think this podcast helps where I still technically get to sit down with people and, and be social and have conversations, but uh, oh, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm being drawn to the screen so hard, right? And I'll 
Joel. I feel like just climbing inside of your yeah. there. Like give, it's like, oh, give, give on, me a I hug like wanna... Jag gave you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to do something like that. It, it's strange. I accept yeah. your digital offer. <laughs> well, the metaverse is coming. We can, we can. Yeah, in uh, yeah, the metaverse in <laughs> uh, in March at the show in Ottawa. I'll I'll cash in on my, on my hug. So okay. So there okay. we go. Game. Yeah, I um, have. So I have a bass player friend that sent yep. in a question. Um, okay. First, he wanted to know what's your go-to bass and amp to kind of get your signature sound. Uh, his name's uh, Selge Menard. And then he had a few more questions. So I'll, I'll start with that one uh, before I just confuse you with 10 more questions. So what a cool you, name he's got. I love that. Selge? Selge. So yeah. Selge Menard. That. Yeah. Selge Menard. Well, uh my good, he's, my he's got the base. French background there uh, in Ottawa. Oh know? yeah, twenty-four beer, bag of chip. Um, the my bass go-to thing. So we were talking. I started as a guitar player, right? So then I, we, I, I play bass in the salads, and then we ended up eventually making the full day to B record with Get Loose, and then we were, I was able to find us with the help of some other friends to find us some video grants and. I was renting bases. I was renting bases for the video. So the base that I'm playing in the Get Loose, I went to along the McQuaid's and I rented it. Um, <laughs> in the video, that's what I'm playing. And I was playing Broadbeck's uh, Music Man from the 70s in the studio because um, it sounds so great. And I didn't have a good sounding bass. Um, and right at that time, at that exact same time, so around 2003, when that record came out, uh, we got warped tour booked. We were put on a lot of the warp tour, um, get loose and become a top 10 hit across the country. I still didn't own a good base. Um, and I just had my first baby, my, my son, who's now 18 years old and goes to U of T. Uh, and, uh, I didn't have a base. I couldn't afford a base. Um, I, I was going to ask if you're like such a minimalist that you don't even own an instrument. Yeah. It's so ridiculous. Right. And so my wife said, why don't you ask someone for a bass? I like, see if someone will give you a bass, like what's your dream bass. And so since I had been recording with the music man and renting music bands for the videos, a music man, I want a music man, an Ernie Ball music man. Um, and so what my wife did is she went online um, she found every single contact she could for Ernie Ball, um, for the company Ernie Ball, put them all in one email and just told her my story. She just was just dead honest. We just had a baby. He's made a record. He has a top 10 hit now. He's going on Warp Tour. He doesn't own a bass and he would love to play Ernie Ball basses. Five minutes later, about five minutes later, Brian Ball, Ernie Ball's grandson, emailed back and said, I'll give you a bass. And that's still the bass I play. So I own two basses. And at the time, um, Brian, so that the company is amazing. We're going to call him Mr. Ball. Mr. Ball. So, well, there's all sorts of them because there's, there's Sterling, too many balls. There's, yeah. <laughs> there's too many balls. <laughs> so many balls, balls everywhere. In the, uh, so there's Sterling Ball, who the Sterling basses are named after. And then there's Ernie Ball, the grandfather, who is a lap steel guitar player. And so they started as a lap steel company. Um, but it's an entirely family and Brian Ball since then. So he, at the time was, it made sense for him at the time because he was the A&R guy for Ernie Ball. And he was um, in charge of the Ernie Ball stages at Warped Tour as well, which was the stage that we were just about to jump on mm -hmm. as well and go on tour. And so it was all really, it just made sense. And so I've been playing Ernie Ball's bases ever since, but it's very specific. So for your friend, um, one of the bases I ordered from them, they sent me the wrong base. They sent me a 4BH, which has two humbucker pickups in it. Um, for people listening that don't know guitars, that's the little box thing that sits under the string on the body of the guitar. And it has little metal circles on it that are magnets that pick up the vibrations of the metal strings. Um, and the, the 4BH didn't sound quite right. And so they mailed me the pickup that they realized I wanted, which is this big, deep, heavy thing. I had to route the base up and stick it in. And so I'm specifically using the pickup that they put in their high-end Music Man Sterling basses, um, but it's sitting inside of all of my guitars. 
and they're these big weird it looks like something eddie van halen would make because you can see the glue popping out of it and it's really messy looking um just looks like maybe this will work and they stuck very two rock together. and roll yeah and it and it and so there's that um but then in addition to that uh i learned um from broadback uh and from jag about bass distortion um i was always playing really really clean other than when like an ampeg or something like that would distort or overload it would start like it would, the amps would always sound better as a show would go on as they got hotter i didn't understand that it was the distortion um so now i'm heavily distorted um so my amps of choice are trainer amps in Canada. Uh, Jeremy, who's the rep at trainer is so genuine and so amazing. It's a Canadian made product. They work great. They sound awesome. They make Neo cabinets that are made of Neo chaotide metal. So they're super light, all the magnets. So I love those. So it's an Ernie ball base trainer cabinets, um, either four twelves or they make uh, 10 by eight inch speaker, these little tiny speakers. Um, and then I, but the majority of my sound is now coming from dark glass products. I'm a dark glass in Dorsey as well. And um, they send me stuff from Finland. It's all made in Finland and they're all geniuses. Their dark glass is electronics is entirely for bass players. And it's all, they just make preamps and distortions um, for bass players and they are insanely smart and they never sleep and they're just always working and working and working. That's what we uh, expect of them. I guess so. It, it's quite remarkable. And so I've been using something called a micro tubes BK seven, uh, with I mother earth. And I've never used anything that's quite so amazing. And I know they recently reissued that. Um, just as an anniversary edition and made it look really cool and put it in a beautiful wooden box. So that's a big part of it. And I would highly recommend trying those. Those they're, They work with a Canadian, a Canadian based company in Saskatoon called Dingwall Bases. Um, and so all of their stuff is sort of designed to work with Dingwall, but they recently have collaborated with Ernie Ball um, so now Bring they're everything full circle here. Yeah. So now it's all sort of coming back and it really works well with, so the Ernie ball with dark glass works really well. Um, I would suggest to your friend to maybe try a ding wall with dark glass though, as well, because that the ding wall with dark glass makes your bass sound like you're hitting big metal rods that are like full of electricity. I don't know how to explain. It's just so bright. It's very descriptive. It's, it's very bright and explosive sounding and thick and heavy. Like, um, I, it's so much fun. And I've had so many front of house guys um, tell me that all they do with the dark glass stuff, because it's a preamp, um, it works remarkably well. They have Bluetooth in them as well. So they're simulating amplifiers and cabinets and um, the Bluetooth, I have an app on my iPhone where I can just send different cabinets and impulse responses to it. Impulse responses are the sound of the air that comes out of the speaker. It's the, dis it's the sound of the air. And so you can, you can load different impulse responses into the pedal. So different ways that the air moves. <laughs> it's that's, okay you're officially the sonic scientist i i so donate ridiculous, that title right you. it's yeah. so ridiculous i'm just trying to make it make sense and and so then i recently i was talking about i did this record with um, a band How, howard benson right howard benson mixed the record and i produced by neil from three days grace um and the mixes i got back from howard benson were not my b7k pedal like I gave them exactly what I thought was the greatest bass tone on the planet, what I use with I'm Mother Earth. Um, and he didn't use it. He took my DI bass, like just my direct bass into their system and did something completely different with it. The um, nerve, the nerve, the nerve, but it, that's the, the confidence same, that he has. In, in but at the talents. same time, yeah, at the same time, I was like, how did he make my bass sound like that? And mm -hmm. Dark Glass had just come out with a pedal um, called Adam that's designed by Adam from Periphery, who mm. is 
I don't know, the periphery. They're a, like a progressive metal band from the US and out of control amazing. Um, their very first record is famous in the production world because um, Adam recorded it all at home in his apartment on a laptop. And it's so crazy sounding like the production is out of control amazing. And so this Adam pedal that came out recently is his signature pedal. Um, and it's five amps all in one pedal. And so when you're playing through it, it's all five of his amps all put into this one thing. Um, and it sounds like Howard Benson's bass. It's so crazy. And when I got it, I was like, it sounds exactly like Howard. And so I've, I've got that bass tone now. Um, but the weird thing is that tone wouldn't work with I Mother Earth. So really your bass tone has to fit the band too, right? So it's like, I, I get a tone, but it's very uh, band specific. Hmm. Is there a specific pick that you use? You were saying that you use a pick, I believe, right? Uh, every once in a while. Yeah, I'll use anything that's heavy that's made out of Tolex, uh, like the turtle shell material that has like a powder on it. So none of, none of the shiny picks, hmm. like the ones that look sort of flat colored, if they're thick and they have that sort of powdery stuff and they're made out of Tolex, a lot of them say Tolex on them. They definitely have their own sound, but I, I, I pick those or choose those picks, pick those picks um, because of that powder and the material that never slips out of my hand when I'm sweating. I sweat a lot when I'm important. Play. Yeah. <laughs> do you have do you have one of those uh, pick holders on uh, on your mic stand, or do you have backup picks somewhere? Uh, no, but I, I actually had. Pick You're so cards. confident in your non slippy <laughs> pick. <laughs> I made a uh, made good friends with a guy early on in his career, a, a couple of years, many years ago now actually, and he makes pick guards for bases. Um, he makes custom pick guards. A friend of mine in Istanbul, in Turkey. Um, name Alperius, and you can find him online, Alperius Pick Guards. Um, Shout and out. at the time, he hadn't uh, made any famous bass player a pick guard yet. He had been making them for his friends, um, and he makes these beautiful pick guards. What I'm getting to is that it's made in a way that I can stuff my picks into it. Hmm. And so I stuff all my picks into that. I don't have them on a mic stand. I just stuff them into the sides of the pick guard. And Alperius, but at the time, he was gifting uh oh my gosh what's her name <laughs> it's escaped me she's so amazing but it's the bass player that played with uh prince hmm. and she's from toronto as well uh oh, it'll come Wait, i remember here. seeing that people i know were posting that she became uh she taught at metalworks she's um, one of the best musicians on the planet too it's she, unbelievable. what's sad is she i believe she, she recently like at the time became the bass player for prince and then he passed away like pretty quickly yeah. after that i remember that well, being he, like he became really good friend she became good friends with him it has great stories but alperius was making was it donna something no we might be talking about because there i know who donna is uh there's that's another, just the name that came to me i'm trying yeah, to think no of there's female. another bass player it'll come to me but uh he was gifting her she's got this great big purple mohawk yeah. and so he was making a, a pick guard that had a big purple mohawk on it um yeah. he does all these metal designs and i'm just a fan of turkish calligraphy and art i think yeah. it's beautiful when you're if you ever get a chance to go to istanbul the turkish art or just anywhere in turkey cappadocia is amazing it's just the the art is unbelievable all that sort of original i think it's all inspired uh through religion but it, it's mm. so gorgeous um and so i had them just do that and there's spaces where i can stick my picks in it and it's so That's beautiful. Amazing. But now Nikki Six has one. Uh, Getty Lee has one. There's tons of famous bass players that have them. Well, now uh, that I think of it, I mean, if you're not stuck to a mic at the front, you could be anywhere and drop your pick. So you might not be anywhere near a mic stand to get that pick. You know, I also have some, we also have really good techs in the band. We have really good stage techs. We have a couple of like some of the best guys in the country for sure. And we've had um billy bracken is amazing um dennis Varellis has been amazing with us uh, uh, is he from london ontario yeah you know dennis he's amazing he, he works I, for the trues now we yeah. we were we were in the same audio engineering course at oer there you go yeah 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 and aaron Mur aaron murphy aaron, aaron murray 
Aaron Murray. There you Engineer, go. Yeah. 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 Great. Great. Such a small great world, man. Musician and producer as well. But, uh, but Dennis worked as one of our stage techs. My point is that there's always a guy that'll run over and hand me a pick too. If needed. <laughs> is there someone that'll run over and hand you a beer too, if needed? That's like equally important. You know? Yeah, of course. Of course. And I do that for people yeah. too. I work back line. It's like to have any kind of, I'm doing real estate now. So now it's like, it's pretty interesting coming back to music because I don't need the money. Um, so I, I feel like I can do whatever I want now. Um, which is so nice, but is before this, you have to do every job in the music business, right? To have a career. You can't just tour stadiums and it sounds crazy, right? I was touring stadiums and you can't, I couldn't afford rent. I couldn't afford my mortgage. Um, and so you have to do everything. I managed a backline company and did all sorts of stuff. So it's anyhow. So do it all. I, so my, my, uh, my, my friend Selge, who sent in that question about the equipment. So he just got the most epic deep dive into the, the instruments that you yeah. play, but his follow-up actually kind of ties in with what you're saying about touring arenas, and not being able to pay rent. Um, and he actually, when he sent this, he said, I sound a little jaded, but I'm going to send this anyways. So his second half is, uh, as a member of two iconic Canadian rock bands, what's your perspective of the Canadian music industry today? And then more specifically, has it become harder to make money and tour? And then what are your thoughts on how it's less about rock now and it's more about poppy music where they don't even play their own instruments? He does sound a little jaded, doesn't he? So that's from <laughs> Selzman. <Minard. laughs> yeah, voice is an instrument. A turntable is an instrument. It is, uh, it, it, that reminds me of when drum machines first came out and drummers were like, that's not real. Fire the drummer. Like it's like uh, people saying, I don't like tuned vocals. They only knew that we were tuning once Cher showed them that we were tuning. Um, so they did like it before that. But it's, what was this question again? It's basically. So uh, what is I, your perspective? I how jaded I am. But it, <laughs> how, how, what's your perspective on the Canadian music industry today as far as being a band and making money and touring? Is it it's harder hard. than before? Well, there, there's like no live industry right now. So that's harder. There's no live industry. So it all went away, right? It all went away because you have to, um, it's a funny thing, right? So the salads made almost all of our money from licensing, from licensing songs to movies, um, commercials. Your commercials? Forget your commercials. See, you remember that one because that was a huge one. That was Labatt's Blue. They did a 12 month campaign with us where they well, only get loose for everything with There's an some option reoccurring to sign royalties on. in there somewhere. Yeah, for an option to sign on. Well, they paid, they paid us out like a flat fee it would, and it was a really good flat fee. It was a lot of money. Um, and we did a lot of that. We recorded a song called lucky day, which never came out on a record, but we licensed it all over the place. GM bought it. Um, and a lot of major films, stuff like that. But it, it, uh, I just got distracted by someone needing my studio, but we had, so the Canadian music business now, trying to do that stuff now is really, really hard. Mm. It's much harder. So back when I was doing it, when I was doing that and making all this money, I kept getting called a sellout. So I would go to 102 at Edge and do an interview and Todd would go, you're a sellout, like right on the radio, right? Like, because you sold your song to Labatt's Blue, you sold your song. Because you make you know, money doing your crap. Yeah, because like, and a like, and even at shows, I remember um major radio DJs walking by or other bands going, ha ah, you guys are sellouts, right? Like, and I was always like, what did you want to do when you were a little kid? Right. And, and, uh, what are you doing now? Right. And it was never what they're doing now. Well, guess what? I'm doing what I wanted to do when I was a little kid and this is how I pay for it. So I'm not a sellout. You're a sellout. Um, but, as, but all of that has changed so much and so before it was there was a ton of opportunity and so i was going out and selling songs to tv and commercials and and making money for the band that way and it's how i bought my first house it's how i bought my first car it's um it's how i was able to start and have a family and be a musician um so i don't know if that's called selling out um but now it's getting paid for your craft it's yeah, getting paid weird, for right the 
your your hard work and your talent it's you delivering a product or a service that people appreciate yeah yeah, yeah. It's, everybody it's crazy how that. in music it's it's being a sellout and every other industry it's being successful it's, like, it's because crazy. of where we were in music though too right it was rock and roll and it was all anti-establishment and you had damn neil young turning down everything neil young did, and yet yeah. the, what neil young was promoting what kurt cobain was promoting and um henry rollins like but henry rollins got into movies like give me a break what yeah. it's uh so we were given a very hard time but as time went on everybody caught on so when everybody stopped buying records which was around 2003 was when it really halted um the start of itunes and the yeah, iPod well and it that. wasn't even that was like napster time right and then yeah. it moved in when did you say 2003 so yeah i guess 2004 yeah. is itunes maybe yeah, it was just right after. Well, it was right around that Napster. time because I remember our stuff, our record coming out and then we we're pushing it into digital after. Mm -hmm. Right. So it was. Um, <laughs> I keep getting lost because there's so much, but uh, the music business has changed so much that now the competition for those ad placements, everybody wants them. So everybody that called us a sellout, every band that called us a sellout, they're all doing it now. Yeah. Um, and so what has happened is a lot of rock bands actually became jingle houses. A lot of rock producers became um, jingle writers. Um, and in turn, my experience has been that the money got less mm -hmm. um, because there's so much more product out there. Like uh, people flooded it um, and they're, it just got harder to make money doing it that way. And what I've learned over the years is the only real way to make money other than licensing and doing that stuff um, and having a top 10 hit, because if you have a top 10 hit, you can make some money, um, is to get your live show together and play live. It's really the only way. And I know the Bare Naked Ladies have realized that. Like yeah. they originally made all of their money selling records then they um, went independent, right? And well, they they, they've always been because they... it was Steven's dad was the distribution company, right? So like yeah. Gordon, that they sold millions of copies. I think I, I've heard a story where they were getting $7 a record, right? Wow. Right off the top, right? And normally uh, you normally you get like a dollar or less, no? Less because you're recouping it first. And then yeah. you and then you might get paid after that. But they like from the very first record sold, dad was in on it. <laughs> Seven bucks in the bank every time. Mm. Um, so you can imagine how that added up. But now those guys, I've heard it from Robin, who's been with them since they were teenagers. He's their front of house and tour manager. And, and um, that they understand that too, that the entire income in the music business is now based in live performance, right? So if you can get your live show together, then you're going to still be okay. Um, and I think that's why the last almost two years of the pandemic has been so hard on all the musicians, the professional musicians I know, because the bread and butter is the live show now. And there's been no live show for two years. Like it's, oh, it's, it's, crazy, it's literally dude. catastrophic. Like it's not the, just the musicians. The, it's more um, like the, the, all the stage production people and the, all the LDs out there, all the front of house guys. The whole industry, and, I guess. Yeah. And the craziest thing that I thought happened at the start of the pandemic, when all of this happened and all of a sudden an entire industry shut down. Um, and I voted for Trudeau, <laughs> but he came on the television and he told people to just go retrain, go retrain, go find a new career. All right. And I'm thinking I have roadies that are in their sixties. I have like, I have guys that it, like the first generation guys are still here and they're all in their seventies now. Um, and now they're losing everything like rapidly um and really go retrain right <laughs> like, yeah. it's just it was a crazy idea and the and i could tell you moving into real estate halfway through the pan like halfway through that like right at the halfway mark right when everything well, was going at the all-time highs in real estate at the all-time highs time. um and to enter an industry that was thriving where everybody was becoming millionaires um very quickly um, and to exit an industry where everybody was losing everything very quickly um, gave me quite a perspective. Whereas when I got my first paycheck from real estate, 
after working my ass off, after feeling, um, I'll just be dead out honest, after feeling suicidal because of where my life had gone, right? I felt like walking off my dock into the lake. Um, it was pretty sad. I knew I had to rearrange and figure out what was going on. And I knew everybody else was feeling this too. Um, but jumping into real estate, I realized that um, I'm part of this wonderful brokerage in Prince Edward County. Of, there's about 25 of us in, in the office that all share this Facebook messenger group where we share ideas and talk. Um, but it became very obvious to me very fast um, that there are entire industries, huge portions of the population that were completely clueless to what happened to the rest of us. And we're thriving, buying real estate, going crazy. Um, I was watching realtors playing games like brokerages playing bidding war games against each other for properties because they had made so much money that all these realtors had so much money all of a sudden that they could all go in. Okay, I'm bidding against you on this property. Maybe you'll get it. Maybe I'll get it. Hawks, high five. And at the same time, <laughs> so many people were like, why are you giving people CERB? Yeah. Right. Like, just get them to go get a job. Look at me making all this. But it's like, oh my God. And so the very first time I made money doing real estate, I bawled. I cried. I lost my mind because it was like my first paycheck in a year and a half. Right. Like my first real paycheck. Um, I pulled over and this group of 25 people, I sent them a long message and told them my whole story. Um, because I was like, I need to change these people. They need some perspective. They need to, not all of them, but there are a few people in there that were giving me a very hard time about being a musician, mm -hmm. right? Well, no wonder, look what you chose and, you know, that kind of crap. A little bit of empathy, people, you know? Yeah, but it, it's like I, uh, I, I made some money and uh, was able to say, um, this is my first paycheck in a year and a half. Yeah. And the music business died like everything I'd worked for for 30 years went away and uh I'm very emotional today and I hope you guys get some perspective from me having to pull over and sob <laughs> right because anyhow that's that's it's been a crazy time right so yeah the music business has definitely changed and it's hard to know what's going to happen now um I've had a lot of like I said, I work in backline. So I work with some of the greatest musicians in the country, like hands down, no, no doubt about it. And I'm not going to mention names because they've actually, I've been told uh, to not ever say it out loud. And I've had people whisper things to me because they say, I don't want the music gods to hear. Um, but they're, what they're talking about is I don't think I'm going to come back. I don't think I want to play live anymore. Uh, I've come, I have a new perspective. I understand what people actually thought of me and uh, I understand that there's actually easier money to be made I want to be with my family like the, all these weird things and so it's hard to like for me I say it's weird because they're the, the greatest and there are people that were on autopilot since they were teenagers and touring around the world and now they're like I don't think I'm going to do this anymore and so when we come back to whenever it's like full on whenever that happens it's going to be a whole new world as well there's going to be so many people missing from it the people that couldn't afford to go on you know hmm. i was getting for a lot of my backline stuff i was still getting paid for canceled shows um in the first year now i'm not because they can't afford to do it anymore right so if a show gets canceled i don't get paid um so as i see this stuff coming up and i know that i'll be able to reimburse myself for christmas presents all of a sudden i'm like uh oh, no, I can't. I just have a visa bill, right? So it's, I got to go sell some houses, but other musicians can't do that. Like they didn't go and retrain like Trudeau asked them to. But <laughs> I think, I think a big difference between the music industry and real estate is that success in the music industry doesn't necessarily mean you're doing well financially versus success exactly in real it. estate is you're getting paid um, for your results. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You get paid really, really, really well. Um, it's a lot of work. I don't think people get paid too much in real estate. I think the real estate just went because it is so much work. Um, some people could say, oh, your commissions are so high, but it's, 
there's but so you're just getting work. that commission you're not getting paid you know you oh, could sell there's... one house in a month so you're getting i mean that's still a lot for well months, you, you know what i mean it's, it's so much work that doesn't get paid like it's yeah. like music in that sense um but you can keep doing it you'll always be able to keep doing it um music is now i've realized that you don't have control over what we did like it's i thought i had complete control and i have no control over it anymore I don't know. I feel like I have control doing this new career. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what has happened because the money is not quite there. And I can tell you coming back, some of the offers are lower now too, because everybody's lost. Um, and so there isn't even the income there. <laughs> so it's, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know. I you know what, I, I think there's a couple things there is number one, now that you you have that source of income, the steady source of income with real estate, you know, now that you can do music because you love doing music, not because that's your skill, you know, like someone has a hammer, you you have your, your instrument. Uh, I, I think there's something to be said for, like you said, being on stage and being able to just play instead of thinking like... I have to be here to, you know, to feed my children, you know? That's right. It feels really nice. It's a nice place to be. And it's my whole perspective has changed too. I feel like I now have the choice whether I want to do this or not. Whereas before I never felt like I had the choice. I just, because I had gotten so deep into it, I had chosen that thing at 17 that you spoke about and just went all in. Um, but yeah, not, I'm I can not see why in. you're I'm not I can all see in anymore. I can see why you're so excited for the upcoming I Mother Earth shows after, you know, not being in that realm for the last year and a half or two years. And I have, I have a listener question here that has to do with the shows coming up. So this is from Eric Clermo. He says, no one ever thought we'd see an IME show where both singers would perform. How did that come about and what challenges did that create? And then there's uh, two more parts here. What is your favorite IME song to play live? And how has the band been able to stay relevant with regular radio play and popular live shows, even though they haven't released an album since 2003? So a lot of questions there, but the, the start killer is... Killer live shows, killer live shows. Yeah, the, the the, the I end. guess the, yeah. the first part of the question is, um, how were you able to get both singers together for some shows and what challenges did that pose? I think my guess, because I didn't orchestrate that, um, and the funny thing for me is I didn't even know it was happening. Um, I, and prior to that, I started having, I was starting to help some friends in real estate sell their houses in the GTA and hooking them up with realtors out in Cape Breton because they all want it. The music business people, they see this opportunity. I can sell my house. I can go mortgage free. I'm not going to lose everything. If I go to Cape Breton, um, Brian lives in Cape Breton. Um, and so I, all of a sudden had this longing to connect with Brian again. And I started reaching out to him again and, and uh, I realized I miss my friend and I, and I put all these posts online. I miss my friend, right? Like I miss my friend and I post a picture of Brian and then I get a call <laughs> from Chris. We're doing a show with both guys. What are you talking about? Right. I'm like, okay, be before, before you go on, can we just yeah. acknowledge the power that you have, the wizardry of putting things out into the ether and they happen. Can we just acknowledge that? Well, I think it's the, you do motivational speaking. It's, it's a truth. It's a, it's a real life truth, but the, the truth is that you have to really mean it. It has to be like in your core. That's mm -hmm. where like, cause they teach this a lot. I'm learning. They teach this a lot in real estate too, right? Like self-actualize, put it out there. Visualization. Um, yeah, visualization. But I don't think any of that works if you don't believe it 1000%, right? Like, <laughs> and so with Brian, I meant it, right? Like I miss my friend. I love my friend. And then he shows up. I'm, I'm not taking credit for it, but I did put it out in the universe. You're right. And, it, and it's happening now. Um, and I don't know what the friction or anything like that is going to be because we haven't gotten together yet. Um, but my guess is it's going to be fine. You know, there aren't really any egos. It, it's, 
the thing I was really surprised with when I first started playing with Ed, when, when they got Ed back for shows about halfway through my time with the band, um, was how humble of a guy he is. He's this great, big, handsome, I can hide behind his biceps on stage. They're so amazing, right? <laughs> he can do a couple push-ups before he goes on stage and all his muscles explode. Like it's this beautiful guy that can sing amazing. And, and, uh, but prior to a show, he'll say, is this, does this shirt look okay? I don't know about this shirt, right? Like, you're like, oh my gosh, right? He's very humble and, and is really no ego. And, and, and Brian is such a down to earth East coaster from Newfoundland kind of guy. It's like, I think it's just going to be really, really, really fun. Um, and my, my best guess would be that, um, you know, Edwin sings, the songs for the first two albums and then Brian sings the songs for the third and fourth album. And then they maybe save a few songs that they don't play from those four albums and then come together for like a mini set at the end where it's everybody. If that, that is my guess. guess, but I have no idea. I think that's a pretty good guess. It's not, I, like I said, I'm, I'm the hired gun in the band. So I don't, I don't make these decisions. It's really, it's the, the brothers, Chris and Jag that, that, do all of this um and i know they work with ed a lot on it now that brian's back they're probably working with brian a lot on it and they work with the band's manager zeke myers he's like a huge idea guy and and i know that zeke is kind of a glue i imagine he had something to do with this whole thing <laughs> mm-hmm. he definitely had a lot to do with ed coming back i think he was able to bring um the brothers and ed into a room together and realize they love each other right after all these years of friction all they had to do is see each other's faces and be like oh man i miss you man <laughs> right? and it's, i think it'll be the same way playing together and, I, and it's really exciting because it's something and um I, don't, I can't think of a time it's ever happened like there's there's it's something I wish Van Halen did. It's something I wish I know they were talking about. They were talking about doing David Lee with Roth Sammy and Hagar and David Lee Roth. And I always say that I Mother Earth is the Canadian Van Halen, where you got it's like this rare thing that happens where you get rid of a singer, get a new singer, and you're still out there doing it. And you're still making records and you're still selling shows. It doesn't matter you changed your singer. Like that's like what band can do that, right? Like <laughs> And uh, it shows the strength of the band that it's not only about the singer, I like it, but it's, uh, I think it's going to be awesome. And I think your evaluation of what's going to happen at the show is probably pretty spot on. Um, I'm really hoping that everybody plays together. I think that'll be awesome. We had a show with, so it was a different percussion player originally um, on the very first I Mother Earth record on Dig. And then Danielle did everything else. Um, and we did shows because this guy lives in Windsor and we did shows with both percussion players on either side of the stage just because it made sense and it was fun. Um, if it feels anything like that, holy cow. <laughs> it's going awesome. to be magic. I, I can't imagine it's not because each guy has is talented in a very unique way that's uniquely them. Um and Ed has sang, Ed has asked to sing Brian's songs. Like we, we played Summertime in the Void with Ed and it's because Ed asked to do it. That's nice. So, like, yeah. do you think David Lee Roth will ever ask to sing a Sammy Hagar song, right? Like it's, it tells you the difference in personalities, right? Like it's mm-hmm. just this guy that's like, it's a good song. I just want to sing it. Like it has nothing to do with him. It's like, <laughs> and he can sing it beautifully. So it, it's, It'll be cool, and I know we all know that Brian can sing the Ed songs because he's already done it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it'll be awesome. It'll be, it, I think it'll be interesting to see if we do any of those. Um, I don't, I haven't had set lists come to me from Christian yet. I'm I'm sure they're coming soon. Um, but I'm really hoping that some of those newer releases they did in the last the three new singles from yeah, in the last couple of years they did with with Brian. Um, I hope we play those because those I, in my opinion, are some of the best I mother earth songs of all time. Um, and they haven't had enough love yet. And I, I think we should play them. 
Hmm. So I'm hoping we do that. I'm hoping we do Devil's Engine. It's so crazy. What so is the Devil's Hell Engine? Hell. Blossom, and there's one other new one, right? Uh, Blossom is really cool. And then We Got the Love is okay. super fun. We Got the Love is, we played that a lot. I feel I, I feel like I could just jump in and play that again tomorrow. The other ones yeah. I have to work on. What 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 is... And my favorite song is Song Burst in Delirium. He asked that, right? I am a favorite song to play live. That for me, it's Song Burst in Delirium, and they don't play it very often. Um, yeah. And it's because it's an entirely bass driven song. For me, it's so fun. It's off of uh, the Scenery and Fish record, mm. right in the middle of there somewhere. It's in six, eight for the most part. There are bars of five, there are bars of just straight up four. Um, but it's so heavily bass driven. Um, that was actually the when they asked me to first play with them, when I got that call from Chris after <laughs> actualizing at the show, the song I learned perfectly was Song Burst in Delirium because it had always been my favorite I Mother Earth song. And I thought today might be the only chance I get to ever play with these guys. They might kick me out of the room. Um, and I want to play Song Burst in Delirium. And so when they asked me, what do you want to play? That was the one. Uh, and my memory of that is jumping into it and about... 12 bars into the song. I remember Chris yelling out. It was just me and Chris and Jag. And I remember Chris yelling out, oh, go, Chuck, go. You're doing it, man. Woo. And he's yelling. And, and I was like, awesome. shit, this is working out. <laughs> right? Like it's happening. I'm playing the songs and they like the way it sounds. Right. Like, and, and uh, so, yeah, that's my one. And then there was one on, and it's the name of the song is escaping me. It's another weird two words title like that and it's on the quicksilver meat dream record mm. um and it's a song the band never ever played live and i bugged them and bugged them and bugged them and bugged them it starts with a dialogue of somebody going japanese women the thing i like yeah, about yeah I, I, I can't remember what the song's yeah. called but that's how it starts that's what precedes mm. the song um i begged them to play that song i said like, we gotta play it we gotta play it we gotta play it and we eventually played it we played it once so that's one of my favorites too. My my favorite is actually No Coma, which is oh yeah, cool. You know, oh, that's, I, awesome that's probably because, my uh, most played IME song, which wow, is not okay. you know, it's not ever you know, it's not you. Yep. You would think someone would say one more astronaut or you know Sunday or or um oh god raspberry or one of those. You yeah, know? yeah. I didn't but, learn uh, one No more Coma astronaut. is has always been on my like best rock songs list. That that's listen. awesome. I've played that. I've played every single I Mother Earth song at this point, but No Coma would have been likely, I don't remember exactly, but it was probably in the soft seat theater shows. Whenever we have like control over lights and sound and mm. where it's a dark room and got to build the mood, right? Yeah. So that's when the slow songs like that come out, right? Yeah. That, what a cool song. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. What, what would you say as we wrap up, what would you say makes you most proud to, to be with I mother earth? Like when you think of the band, when you think of your time with them, what makes you proud about that? It's not just for a paycheck. It's not just whatever. What is it that like pulls at the heartstrings that, makes you say yeah i'm i'm with i mother earth and you know is when i was asked to do the gig like no question i it's right on surface is uh when i was asked to play that gig when i got that call and i practiced and then would sleep three hours and get up and practice um my kid was eight years old at the time and he was watching me do that um and I can tell you how proud I am because it makes me want to cry. He came in the my bedroom the day after I did that song Burst in Delirium with him where I went to my first rehearsal and I played and he came in the room. He woke up early. He came in and he woke me up. And he shook me. He goes, what happened? I just put thumbs up and he put his hand out for a high five and we high five. And so that's my proudest thing. Hmm. That's by far. That's... And, and, and because he learned... He learned so much by watching that happen that um, he has that, 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 that in him now where he knows that he can do anything he wants. You can do anything you want. You just have to work for it, right? You have to work for it. You can't expect it to be given to you. You have to work, 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 work. And if you put in the work, 
more likely it's going to happen right like so it's he's got those master manifester dreams that he's that, the only kid have, in his you know? whole high school that got it got into u of t like and he's mm -hmm. in a very tough program and he's excelling um and he's also a scooter kid like a skate park kid and it's off the charts how amazing he is like it's nice and uh, uh kid, kids don't do what you say they do what you do so him seeing yeah. you go for your dreams is, is a big and deal. so that's it and and we did a i i posted a new picture that my wife took as my facebook on my facebook on the chuck daly facebook on the i don't know what you call it but it's on the top of your your header i guess the banner and, and yeah the banner um and it's a picture that my wife took of both of my boys watching me play at edge fest and so that's i think you might have been at that show but they're yep. um it's the coolest picture because it's like this perfectly framed both of their heads just watching me um or, or watching the crowd they love watching mosh pits um but they came to i remember them coming to oshawa when we were touring with our lady peace and the standstills um and oshawa was completely sold out the arena there in oshawa i can't remember what wow. it's called pepsi center or something but it's uh it was amazing like it, it, you do stadiums you sell out and then if there's more tickets you start moving the stage back you open up more floor seats and you try to squeeze the stage as far back as possible right and that's what we did there so that was one of our biggest selling shows and it was three levels like tiny little people and they got to stand right in front of me right and and i and watching them and playing and watching them just look around and knowing that they watched what i had to do to get that that's what makes me proud mm. and it also is. those moments when i hear something that's like out of this world coming from like stage right or coming from behind me and i look over and i see jag and i remember like in, in my in and then I see that guy that I used to go see in concert at Lee's Palace or the Cool House, or I see that guy, I'm completely removed for a second. That happens on stage, which yeah. is remarkable, where I'm completely removed and all my hair stands up and I have to swallow my heart because I'm like, oh, this just happened, right? Like, here I am. Like, and, and yeah. So that's, with a, with, with a, a rock star for a father, do your kids think you're cool or are you just another schmuck in the household? No, they don't think I'm cool. No. No. no, rock guys aren't cool. If I was like, if I was inventing technology, yeah. Like kids don't line up for records or concert tickets anymore. People, they line up at the Apple store, right? Like it's like- Unless you start playing bass for Justin Bieber or something. Actually, your kids are too old maybe for that I've now, but... asked Justin Bieber many times. And I, and because I know his guitar player. So I've yeah. like put it out to them so many times. And that's, yeah. you know, you're a guy about getting, you know, what drives you and- how do you get those things and how do you get there and what is it that gets you there? And it, that's what it is. It's like, it's just being fearless. Like, and I can tell you in real estate, it makes people crazy. A lot of people get pissed off because I do it constantly, but yeah. it's like, but it's like just constantly asking, Hey, come work with me. It's going to be fun. Hey, Justin, I want to play with your band. I want to do this. I want to do this. I, I need to play with you and you need to play with me. Right. Like it just, relentless i have never got that gig but uh, maybe it'll happen after maybe he'll hear this podcast there you go yeah. i will be the bridge <laughs> yeah most people don't get what they want because they just don't ask it's that they simple. just don't ask you're that's it absolutely that, the best lesson i ever learned was from my wife and um when i met her she was very religious at the time and i and i think it's taken from the bible but she said um i'm not very religious but it, it's the line is asking you will receive right? That's a, a line. You have not because that, you ask not. Yeah. That's a line in that book asking you will receive. And yeah, you're right. in that other part of that. And, uh, and that's the best lesson I ever learned because that's what paid for Dan Broadbeck. That's what paid for, that's what, and it was, um, people asking me to play shows for the salads and finally doing what she said, well, it's going to cost you $5,000. <laughs> right it was like before that it was like oh sure a hundred bucks yeah oh some nacho chips and some water sure we're there right like and uh she said you have to ask it's asking you will receive right and and uh sure enough i five thousand dollars i'd land at three like ten thousand dollars i'd land at seven 
right? Like, and, yeah. it, and it's, it's asking you will receive. So, yeah. so we have one final question sent in from a fan and this ties in, you just mentioned the biggest show you ever played was with Our Lady Peace in Oshawa. So, I think so. yeah. So his question, this is a little out there. Okay. So put on your creativity cap for this one. Okay. This is from Jeffrey Stone, who is a very talented singer songwriter. Uh, his question is if Our Lady Peace and I Mother Earth were to merge into one super group like the Traveling Wilburys, what would that group be called? And what would the implications be for planet for the planet and life as we know it? Oh, Mother really? Earth, Our Lady Peace, one super group. What do you call it? And what are the ramifications? You know, we've we've toured so much with those guys uh, and played so like even our shows, the few shows we played up at Burles Creek, and then we flew out to Edmonton and played a, a Welcome Back Festival, I think it was called. Um, was with Our Lady Peace. Uh, I feel like we are one band. I do. Like, it feels like one big band. Like, well, one of my favorite things about getting to Burles Creek after two years of not seeing anybody um, was walking up on the stage and seeing those guys at Soundcheck and going, oh my God, my bandmates. There's my mates. You know, like, hey, Jason, uh, Duncan, hey, it's been so long, right? And I, you could see the way they look back. They feel the same way. Um, and it's, I don't know. I say we're one band. And so we've done tours where it's OLP times IME, where it's OLP X IME is what the, all the sweaters and shirts say. So that's our band name, OLP X one. Like just an OLP X IME, just one like when uh, new kids on the block and the bare naked ladies tour, they were NK, blah, blah, blah. They just put all the letters together. NK, T-O-B-B-N-L. Yeah. It'd yeah. be the same sort of thing. OLP X IME. And, yeah. uh, the implications for the world would, uh, <laughs> bring the rock radiation to the people yeah it would just be it would be nice for things to roll along like they were before the world stopped right and the implications for the world are to get it all back because that's what we were doing before it started so so jeffrey stone was being clever and he says the 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 proper name for the band is also what the implications would be so the name and implication it would be peace on earth. Ah, peace on earth. Makes me think of the uh, U2 song. I love that song. <laughs> there you go. So I have one more question for you. Can you handle one more question? We've gone I two hours handle already. Many. Yeah, yeah. No, it's all good. Okay. I gotta go do some radio shows, but I'm good. Got to, got to roll the chuck wagon out this Saturday. So there you go. So if, if we created a time machine where you could go back in time, and you could sit down next to 10 year old Chuck Daly. What advice would you give to your younger self with all the years of, of experience and challenges and mentorship and lessons and training and all that stuff? What is the best advice that you could give to your younger self? Uh, don't listen to Al Lalonde, Chuck, your guitar teacher, because Eruption by Eddie Van Halen is not a trick. He plays that, and you can play that too. That is the most rock and roll answer I've had in 32 episodes. On I didn't podcast. think it was possible. I didn't think it was possible because of what Al Lalonde told me. Um, and if someone at that age, I was about 10 years old, had told me, oh, no, that's possible. You can play that. If he can play that, you can play that, because that's how I teach. If that guy can do it, so can you, right? Like, hmm. um, there's no reason, you know, you're a human. You have a guitar in your hand, right? Like, and so is he. So it's, uh, or so Don't is set she. those limitations. Yeah. And so I was, I was uh, held down when I was little. And I, and I feel like if I was actually given an opportunity to explore that, that I would be a way, way better musician. So there you go. That's there the advice that I wish someone had given me. I wish someone had given me the advice that I give everybody, which is you can do it. Right. So, well, that's amazing that, you know, you figured out that lesson and then you're able to make your little dent in the universe by being different and, and giving current 10 year olds what you didn't get when you were 10. Oh yeah. I say it a lot. Yeah. 
I do it all the time. <laughs> For sure. That's how I treat uh, real estate clients. Like so many people feel like it's not possible because they're first time buyers or they're, uh, um, they have a very limited budget. It's like, no, it's possible. We'll make it happen. We'll figure it out. Right. And it always is. It always is. So far in my experience, it always is. Right. So. So we, we covered a lot over the last two hours. Is there anything that we didn't cover? Is there anything that you want to share with our listeners before we wrap up? Or did we, we go deep into the weeds and give everyone everything they wanted? I think we gave them what they wanted. If they, maybe it's something they don't want. Um, some people that are listening, but uh, if you want to see us play live again, go get your vaccine. There's so many people that haven't. Um, I know a lot of people that haven't makes me feel like they don't care about me, makes me feel like they don't actually love me, that they only care about themselves. Um, because for me, the vaccine is about caring about everybody um, and helping everybody get back to the things they love. Um, and there's too many people just focusing on themselves. So, so if, if people want to follow <laughs> that's your journey... My, that's my unpopular advice to some people is to go get your damn vaccine. That's good advice. If people want to follow your journey online, if they want to maybe reach out and say, Hey, you know, love, love the podcast or send some kind words, where would they find you online is, is Facebook, Instagram, where, where do well, they go? I'm, I'm in all of those places. I I'm a big Instagram user. I jump back on Facebook. I got out of Facebook after, uh, after the, the, us election in 2016 I, I shut it down and i i was like okay i'm done with this all right this is dangerous um but i uh i came facebook back facebook is so my, more my, your private account though right yeah, instagram so is where people should be no well facebook is my kind of like promoting myself as a realtor account now because i hmm. came back to do real estate and different clients and so really my life my real self you'll find in pictures on instagram so you can just look up chuck daily and it's all the letters d as in dog a i l e y um or you can look up my instagram handle for real estate i live in prince edward county and so i'm the county realtor um that's really easy to find and all of that is also found at the county realtor.com or dot yeah, dot com. I might have the dot CA as well. I can't remember. Um, but you can also find me on 993countyfm.ca and you can listen to me on the radio there too. So perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, Chuck, thank you for your time. Two hours. I mean, I, I've been a I stood in line at 14 for an autograph. So this I think you know, that's so beautiful. I, I love for that me so to much. be able to to sit down with you for two hours and you know this is supposed to be for my audience but really it's, it's just me picking the brain of of someone i'm that, a fan of right that so, idea for me is really special too joel I, it's i'm a fan of you being there like it's it's so wicked it's so cool that that it's like hung on and stuck with you and that you're here doing this with me today like it's like wow <laughs> Like, I, I'm a fan of you standing in that line. Like, a, it's like, I want your autograph. Like, wow, look what you did. <laughs> it's amazing. It's too cool. I love that that's what brought us together. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Chuck. I appreciate it. And uh, to all the listeners, thank you for, for joining us today. And we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the questions. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and I'd love to hear from you guys. My goal is to grow this podcast organically where you're giving me feedback on topics you'd like me to cover and guests you'd like me to interview. You can reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L and on Twitter at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message and I'll see you on the next episode.